gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to travel across the pages of your holy word here in this epistle to the Romans. I thank you, Lord, for all of those who have been blessed by this teaching. I just ask that you would continue to do that and to seal to our hearts that which is truth, filtering out all of the foolishness and the ignorance. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we have finally made it to the end of Romans, or just about. I think that there is a verse in the epistle that sort of sums up the entire epistle. Uh, Romans 15, 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. I'd like to get you to travel with me to the end of this study, beginning at verse 19 and 20, where Paul writes, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So in the context of looking at what I have suggested, I, I believe that what the church should, how the church should be in the first 16 verses, and in the context of those that cause division that we are to avoid, and that's not out in the world, but that's within the, the, the confines or the structure of our fellowship. I think that what Paul is saying here is that is that within the context of divisions within the church, you should look forward with, with joyous confidence to the time when all of this turmoil and this conflict will give way to peace. Of course, we know that uh, from history, we know that the Romans were headed for some real trouble. That Paul is saying, you, you haven't begun to feel the bitterness of divisions as yet, but I foresee a time when you will. And I foresee a time when all will be hushed and quelled and our great adversary himself will be forever overthrown. This seems to be the mind of the Holy Spirit at the closing of this, of this epistle, with an emphasis on the grace of God. And the word will bruise there, the language here refers to the prediction in Genesis 3.15, uh, I believe it's 3.15. It here means to subdue, to gain the victory over. It denotes Paul's confidence that they would gain the victory and they'd be able to overcome those who were endeavoring to sow discord and contention among them, among the saints, wherever they gathered. We know that Satan is the author of all attempts to, to promote discord in the church. So, they who attempt to produce divisions are called his ministers in 2 Corinthians 11:15. This is the only epistle of Paul which closes with a doxology. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. I 
so appreciate all of you who have, have hung with me here through this long journey through the epistle to the Romans, 16 chapters. I know that, that some of you are no doubt still searching, uh, that you have questions, that you're struggling to understand uh, the gospel that Paul has delivered to us uh, co as compared to the gospel that is m most commonly preached today, that some of you are even vacillating. Take note of verse 25. God alone has the power to strengthen you. He has the power to do that, to establish you. That is, firmly plant you so that the vacillating will cease. To make you stand, the word implies to be secure, according to my gospel, according to the gospel which I preach, Paul says, the doctrines which I have been defending in this epistle. It's uh, called his gospel, you know, not because he was the author of it, okay, but uh, because others... Uh, you know, others also preach that gospel, but because he had been particularly defending it in this epistle. The doctrines which were suited to strengthen and confirm them, the doctrine of justification, of election, of perseverance, uh, uh, and as much as it's, it's so hated, you know, the doctrine of predestination and all of the 11 chapters of doctrine that we were given before the practical application which followed of, of the protection and the favor of God to both Jews and Gentiles both. These were the doctrines which he had defended. Doctrines that give stability to the Christian faith, to the Christian's hope and love. That is the gospel committed unto me to preach. Uh, we see him state as much in, in the second chapter of Romans, as well as in first and second Timothy. And the preaching of Jesus Christ, for he is the word. I believe the, the reason the Holy Spirit brings Christ into this here is because he is the word. Christ is the author and the subject, the author and finisher of our faith. The announcement of Jesus Christ. The phrase seems to be added as declaring what Paul's gospel was rather than, you know, as referring back to Christ's personal teaching. According to the revelation, according to the communication of what has been so long concealed, but which is now made manifest. And uh, we know the word mystery means what is hidden or concealed any doctrine which was not before known you know what had not been before revealed the word here seems to refer to the principal doctrines of the gospel its main truths which had been concealed especially from the entire gentile world but which were now made known which was kept secret in other words which was kept in silence the greek word means uh, were not it wasn't divulged it wasn't proclaimed and since the world began in all past times and this refers particularly to the Gentiles because the Jews had some at least a limited understanding of these truths but they were now made known to all the world you know through uh, Judaism they were exhibited in types shadows sacrifices and uh, and so on and so forth wrapped up in darkness and silence compared to the more clear revelation of it in this present age in which we're living the age of grace the dispensation of grace the phrase since the world began means in the greek in eternal times that is in all past times they've always been concealed but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise or to the only wise God depending on 
what translation that, that you have. Be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And folks, a whole sermon could be preached on that one word, glory. The definition of that word is to have a proper estimation of, of something's value or worth, something or someone. And uh, I spend a whole lot of time thinking, you know, about the the estimation of of Christ's value that the world religious system actually holds. I don't know how to sum up this epistle properly, folks, I, and I hope that I've done a, at least an adequate job of carrying us through all of these tremendous verses. I, I feel more like ending this study, uh, this final conclusion on Romans with more of a, a personal note to all of those, all of you who have followed us uh, through this. totally depraved we were in bondage folks to the fallen will of the sin nature it couldn't choose anything good spiritually dead unable to remedy our lost condition which is why the good news is so often rejected they just can't accept it they can't hear they can't believe and so we try to coerce them into doing so, and, and sometimes we feel like we succeed in doing so when, in fact, we've really only made the situation worse. Because God saves sinners, not us. And life must precede all else. Life, everything, folks, began with life. In the very nature of the gospel itself, we see that everything began with that spark, that, that first spark of life. And yet when modern Christianity approaches this subject, they want to convince us that it all began with us. Uh, we know what Christ did, but it, it really regeneration begins with us. We, we are that spark. And that is absolutely not biblical. Life must precede all else. Otherwise, it's like giving medicine to a cadaver. Man, folks, is not sovereign. God is. Modern Christianity elevates man as being he puts him in the position of being sovereign. The idea that man holds the final trump card, so to speak, is untrue and it corrupts every aspect of sound biblical doctrine. Every aspect of that doctrine which we've seen. And there are numerous reasons. There's probably a multitude of reasons why the world religious system that preaches this non-existent free will because they fail to, to accept the truth concerning total depravity and, and they fail to distinguish between the freedom of will to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a ham and cheese sandwich they, they know that they can do that so they surely they must have free will when it comes to regeneration they fail to, to make that distinction there are so many reasons why the world religious system that I've referred to as that system based on human merit that preaches this this non-existent free will in the matter of the new birth uh, 
I, I hardly even know where to begin, but first, folks, it's, it is what Satan would have men believe, because since by that, God is robbed of the glory that he deserves. And that's Satan's entire mission. And he'll do that any way he can. Satan is the God of this world. We know that. Not, not the God of a mostly silent minority that insists God must act first or no one would be redeemed. God is sovereign and he, and he determined that his people be the minority, not the majority, folks. And so, therefore, this opposition that we endure is great. But its opposition is designed for our growth. And Paul is trying to, I believe, tell the Romans that there's going to come a day when all of this will be resolved. That gives us strength. That gives us strength to endure it. So all is well as we suffer for the sake of the gospel. And birth was the illustration God gave. And I have pointed this out on numerous occasions. We did not birth ourselves. No baby ever decided that he was going to be born. Just the name Father means that he begat us. The illustrations that are given uh, in Scripture, throughout Scripture, make this crystal clear. The one of seed being planted, that we did not plant ourselves. No seed ever, ever planted itself. And the same is true as it regards the birth of sheep and goats. Christians were, were never goats. They were lost sheep gone astray who were found. Goats don't become sheep. You were always a sheep. when You were just lost and you were found. That's the picture that we were given in the word of God concerning you. They were lost sheep gone astray who were found. Goats never become sheep, and sheep never become goats. The true gospel is believed by the few, not the many, and it's rejected by the masses. And this should not surprise us. We may become disheartened over that fact, but it shouldn't surprise us. We are the few. The idea that few are called and many are chosen makes no biblical sense. Israel, God's chosen nation, as compared to all the rest of the nations, the nations, the Gentiles, illustrates a minority. It is not the narrow road that leads to destruction, folks, but the broad. And this corruption entered early into the new church. It's been with us since the beginning. And it, it has only increased every generation. Saving one's self makes no sense. That is what so-called free will suggests. It Free will ideology, philosophy human philosophy that's carried over into theology it has no use for the word elect it has no use for the word chosen doesn't know what to do with those words except in suggesting that God chose us if we chose him which is insanely ridiculous if man must choose God for God to choose him then election itself makes no sense what God just put the word election there to confuse us 
Self over Christ makes no sense. The flesh over the spirit makes no sense. The few hating the world religious system makes no sense. If that's true, then they don't have a thing to worry about. Jesus told his disciples that the world would hate them, that the masses would hate the few. And that is exactly what we see happening today, not the other way around. The few are not hating the masses. The few are preaching salvation to the masses. Comfort for the masses in relation to the few makes no sense. They have their own numbers to comfort them. They comfort them with words, though, that are not true. In studying through this epistle, we have seen all five tenets of Calvinism. And I've been asked that question over and over. Steve, does that mean, are you saying you're a Calvinist? Let me explain this. That TULIP acronym, Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, and perseverance or preservation, as I prefer to call it, of the saints is biblically, doctrinally correct. It is sound biblical doctrine. What these people fail to understand is that John Calvin was just a man who held to and reaffirmed these principles of sound doctrine. Jacob Arminius, on the other hand, opposed them, reversed them. And modern evangelicalism is Arminian. Therefore, it despises Calvin and anyone associated with Calvin, anyone who adheres to those tenets, believing, falsely believing that they originated with one man who was a heretic, when in fact, Calvin was only preaching the true gospel. Paul was a Calvinist. Now, you may not agree with that, but you cannot argue against the truth of this, this that Paul's presented in this epistle. This epistle has taught every one of those five tenets. Total depravity, unconditional election, unlimited or, or limited atonement as far as the substitutionary sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, irresistible grace, because you were his, he drug you into a relationship with him and preservation of the saints. Our standing before God, righteous and blameless, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight, is a minority position. Yet it's scripture. And it is unaccepted and, and unheld by the masses. We're looking at religion, the masses, as compared to relationship, the minority. God's people ensnared by this religious system, they suffer from an identity crisis because that system is not teaching them what we've learned here. It's not teaching them who they are in Christ. And they so need to know this. Israel's failure to keep the law repeatedly, repeated failure to keep the law, proves the position taken by the world religious system is entirely unbiblical. It's all about law, or it seeks to merge or mix the two into one cohesive system. Folks, that can't be mixed. Christ is the end of law to everyone who believes. In fact, the church owes its very existence to Israel's failure to keep the law. If the law could have been kept, there would have been no need for Christ in the church. The position held by the masses makes no sense given the fact that we cast our crowns at his feet.
its philosophy would demand that they keep those crowns because they came to them by works. And if the masses were the narrow road that leads to life and we were the wide, the praises and the hymns that will echo throughout eternity would make absolutely no sense whatsoever. The constant conflict which we endure is not primarily outside the world religious system out there in the world. But as Paul says, among those who are within, folks, it's always been that way. You're not going to have a whole lot of trouble with people that don't care about Jesus Christ. But you're going to have a lot of conflict with those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're teaching the truth of this book. It's always been that way and it always will be. The body of Christ ministers to itself first, where it is then equipped to go out and reach a lost and dying world. And we are living in an age where that the church argues against the very truth revealed by the Holy Spirit, even in the first epistle. The true Romans road is not what man must do. It only has one stop, and that is what Christ did. Even, you know, Wikipedia, I can understand Wikipedia, you know, explaining it as a book in which Christ is offered. Because they borrow that phrase from the world religious system. God does not offer salvation to anyone. Man is spiritually dead and unable to respond. His election is sure. God's grace is irresistible. We are justified freely without a cause. That God makes an offer that man can accept or reject is entirely unbiblical, folks. It ignores sound doctrine. Not one Christian, not one of us, not one among us is here because of what we did, of, of what we accepted. Well, you know, we're better than the next guy because we accepted Christ, you didn't. The only reason you accepted Christ is because, because Christ died in your place and you couldn't help but accept him. You could not help but believe in him. Because God's grace is irresistible. God came to save you. He came to save his own people from their sins. That is what this book teaches. But that is not what you're being taught. That God makes an offer that man can either accept or reject. It ignores sound doctrine. It is a perversion of Christ's good news. Because it promotes a religion based on human merit and human pride. No different than all the other religions of the world. It results in a multitude of false converts. It robs God of the glory that he deserves. It elevates man and it suppresses Christ. Grace is not an offer. It is the sovereign act of a majestic God in redeeming his people through the precious blood of his son. Those whom he chose in Christ before the foundation of the world. The idea that they have is entirely made up. It is a religion based on emotion, not on scriptural fact. We are to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 I've stated my belief before that the light of the true gospel of grace has grown so dim as to be barely noticeable in a world that has grown darker by the day. 
And what sets Christianity apart from every other religion, folks, is that it is not about our doing something to appease an angry God. And yet that defines modern Christianity today. We are indeed a <laughs> peculiar people because we find comfort in a grace that is freely bestowed, never earned, grace that lays waste to human pride, where we glory in Christ, not in self, in what Christ did, not what we do. And if that sanctifies us, if it sets us apart as a mostly silent, lamb-like minority, well, at least we're in good company. Not just with one another, oh no, no, but with every saint that has gone before us, our brothers and sisters, folks, died defending the gospel that we were shown in this epistle. The least that we can do is preach it during a time of relative comfort, peace, and safety. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.